Before we begin this podcast, we'd like to remind listeners that NetWealth is licensed to provide general financial product advice only, and that this podcast isn't tailored to any particular person's objectives, financial situation, or needs. Before a listener acts on any advice in this podcast, they need to think about whether it's appropriate for their circumstances or their clients, and consider the product disclosure statement for any proposed investment, and also seek any professional advice they need. NetWealth Investments Limited is the issuer of NetWealth financial products. For NetWealth Financial Services Guide, contact details, and other information about our products and services, you can visit our website at netwealth.com.au. Today's podcast guest is a financial product issuer. NetWealth and the guest have a commercial arrangement that enables investment in products managed by the guest through NetWealth's platform. Under that arrangement, NetWealth may receive fees from the podcast guest. More information about the fees NetWealth receives is provided in our financial services guide, which is available on our website or by contacting us. Welcome to the NetWealth Portfolio Construction Podcast, brought to you by the NetWealth Investment Research Team. In this podcast series, we pick the brains of key wealth management professionals to uncover opportunities and challenges for investors on a diverse range of topics. We hope you enjoy their unique perspectives. Welcome to the NetWealth Investment Podcast series. My name is Paul O'Connor and I'm the Head of Investment Management and Research at NetWealth Investments. In my role at NetWealth, I manage and govern the investments that are made available to you through the NetWealth Investment platforms. Today, we have Roger Montgomery, the Founder and Chief Investment Officer of Montgomery Investment Management. Welcome back, Roger. Great to be with you, Paul. Montgomery have a number of funds, both across Australian and international equities, available on the investment platforms. Um, So really, I think we're fortunate to have Roger as a guest on our portfolio construction series. Um, And I think we had you on in February recently, providing insights into the market. But gee, February feels like a long time ago, given that all that's happened over the last eight weeks. Given Roger's expertise um, and focus in managing Australian equities portfolios, I thought we'd focus today on the discussion on the Australian economy and market. However, starting with the global economy, Roger, what are your thoughts on the impact that COVID-19 is having on global GDP? And do you think a global recession is inevitable? Well, I think we're already in a recession, Paul. I don't think that question... Um, I don't think there's any doubt. Uh, you know, we know that GDP has fallen off a cliff. We know that um, productivity has disappeared. Um, we know that uh, output is gone. We know that uh, incomes are decimated. We know that jobs are decimated. So uh, we're we're in a we're in a recession. The question is, how long does it last, and uh, and how do we come out of it? Yeah, it's interesting that I'm I'm hearing more and more discussion and debate around trying to understand the duration of the impact of the economic slowdown. Um, And I think, yeah, it's very pertinent, the points you make there, that there is no doubt um, the global economy slowed significantly. Yeah, well, it's gone backwards. Um, So, you know, by definition, and it's gone backwards so deeply that even if in the next quarter we had, uh, you know, we had less... Negativity, uh, we'd still be we'd still be negative over the two quarters, uh, and so um, yeah, the question yeah the question's not whether we're in a recession. I I, I think I think it's really important um, to understand that the economy wasn't going that well before COVID nineteen hit or before the coronavirus outbreak, uh, and and you know we had Europe. Uh, teetering on the brink of recession anyway. We had the US slowing according to some measures. Uh, and Australia, you might remember, we had, this is before Christmas, we had a um, a retailing recession. We had uh, housing approvals falling off a cliff. Housing approvals or residential approvals were down about 40% uh, over the year. Uh, and so we were already quite weak in Australia, in Europe, the United States, Japan, even before this hit. So when we come out of this, it's important to remember that, w- that what we emerge into uh, was not all that appealing anyway. It was still quite weak. Mm-hmm. Do you think the um, the recession then will have somewhat of a cleansing effect on the economy, i.e. some of these business models and sectors that you've had some concerns about for some time now, um, that they may not even exist or they'll exist in a very different structure uh, going forward? Well, yeah, I think that's right. I think you might remember when we last spoke um I talked about some of the warning signs that were, it might not have been the last time we spoke, the time before that, but 
we talked about a bubble in private equity, for example, and uh, and I I demonstrated that there was a an enormous amount of growth in the number of private equity funds uh, around the world and that they were growing at a much faster rate than the population and consequently there were more deals being done and those deals were more competitive and so they were being done at higher prices. And then I made the point that you've got all these people being employed in all of these startup businesses that are that have their jobs purely because of the altruism of private equity investors and as soon as you have a risk-off event, and I remember saying, I don't know what is going to cause investors to go risk-off and why they'll want to um, uh, take money out of the market. But if and, if and when they do, that, that money to support all of those jobs uh, will be pulled uh, and, um, and that'll, that'll, you'll see large job losses. And that's exactly what's happened. And so in the private equity space, there's the change uh, in terms of the workforces, uh, money isn't limitless, uh, and so or there's a realization that money isn't limitless, and so you got a lot of lot more people on the on the dole queue uh, all around the world. Mm. Yeah, it's um, it is interesting the comments on private equity, and I guess we've also seen a changing nature of the investors and buyers of. Um, of private equity over the last decade, even where it appears to be the domain of the um, the investment banks trying to restructure and and refinance companies there. So, which um, which I'm with you has led to, I guess, some scepticism and I guess some question marks over um, over the purpose and of what they're trying to achieve. Um, moving to the Australian economy, I'm assuming then, based on the comments you've made already, you think that. Australia is in a recession as we speak? Uh, look, yes, I think so. I mean, I, I actually don't think it matters what the number is. Uh, we all know that, you know, when you when you basically put an economy into a hard stop, uh, it's going backwards from the year before and the quarter before. Therefore, we're in a recession. Mm. Mm. So, given we've had, have not had a recession since the early 1990s, what areas of our economy are particularly vulnerable that are really worrying you at the moment? Uh, look, I'm I, I'm an investor, so I'm I'm looking at any weakness as an opportunity rather than as a risk. So, as we're recording this, uh, the coronavirus uh, itself and the shock of that. Uh, that's that's yesterday's news. Uh, so the narrative now is about returning to work and governments plotting and planning ways to get the economy going again. So rather than thinking about things that I'm worried about, I'm thinking about things that uh, that I see as being um, uh, the highest leveraged opportunities or the, the opportunities with the greatest leverage to the recovery. Uh, and those happen to be the things that have done the worst, I think. You know, so travel, for example, uh, I think travel um, will bounce back uh, because people have been cooped up in their homes, unable to go on holidays, unable to visit their relatives, unable to uh, take up uh, the various uh discounts and deals that they they took when they booked their holidays and so there'll be enormous pent-up demand uh, to go away again and uh, one anecdote I can give you to support that thesis is uh, we're aware of uh, a, a person who works for one of the big cruise lines um, they in Europe and they sent uh, an offer out to their passengers whose cruises were cancelled they gave them two choices. They said they offered them a full cash refund immediately or a 200% credit for a future cruise. Uh, our, our intel uh, informed us or our informant told us that, um, that there was something like a 99% uh, take-up rate uh, in, the, uh, in the offer of a 200% credit. So people want to travel. That's not been killed. Uh, people will travel again. How long that takes before we can travel freely and 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 normally again without masks and without uh, temperature checks? Uh, yeah, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that 
some of the pricing for travel companies and travel related companies um, basically assumed that there would be no revenue growth ever again. Uh, and that's just nonsense. Mm. So I guess from that comment, uh, do companies like Flight Centre or even Virgin have any um, any interest? Well, yes, they do have interest, but you've got to just look at their balance sheets and their cash burn. Uh, and what you've got to realise is that you're an equity holder. So assets minus liabilities equals equity. And if you don't participate in a, a future capital raising, uh, then you could be diluted. And so the share price for you might not recover to you know, to the levels the shares had previously been at. Um, and so it's it's important to understand that while these, the companies that you mentioned, Flight Centre and Virgin, are interesting, uh, we've got to look at the balance sheet and number one, ask the question, will these businesses survive? That's the first thing. And then if they are going to survive, you know, how much capital do they need to do it? Then they've, they've raised, so in the case of Flight Centre, they've raised money. Um, about seven hundred million dollars, but what form do they take once they've raised that money? Uh, so, in the case of Flight Centre, they've closed fifty percent of their stores, or eight, they're closing eight hundred stores. So, their ability to generate the level of revenue that they generated before is obviously uh, changed. So, it's a smaller business now, growing off a lower base. Uh, so, that's the first thing to consider. And then, if you think about the impact of the capital raising. So when you raise money at a deeply discounted price, you can dilute the equity per share on a per share basis. And then if you use that money to pay off debt, for example, which is important in this environment, um, then the return on equity from the capital or the return on the equity that you raise, if you only use it to pay down debt, is the interest rate on the debt that you've paid off. And so you dilute your return on equity as well. So a business that might have had $10 of equity per share earning 20% might now only have $5 of equity per share earning 10%. And so its intrinsic value is a lot lower now than it was before. And so while the business might survive, its value, its intrinsic value, what it's really worth is a lot lower than what it was worth before. And so you could still make money on that but you've got all those risks to think about. You've got survivor risk, you've got the, the dilution of returns and profitability, and you've got the dilution of your stake in the business. And so the share price might initially bounce off the fact that the capital raising has been successful, but it might drift back down again once everyone realises that the uh, that the intrinsic value is lower than it was before. And the share price won't recover to where it was before for, for potentially a decade, maybe more. Yeah, I guess those comments, Roger, certainly highlight to me that you really need to undertake that research on the company. You've got to really understand the company and understand that balance sheet before uh, considering participating in any of these uh, capital raisings that we're starting to see on the market. Yeah, it's basic um, stock, stock analysis 101. Yeah, yeah. Active management, I guess. Um, yep. Uh, in action there, really. Um, moving on to, uh, I guess, the Australian government, in terms of the fiscal response, it appears to have been extraordinary and certainly the RBA wasted no time in supporting from the monetary policy perspective by dropping the cash rate to 25 bips or 0.25%. What are your views on the response and do you think it's been sufficient? And I guess there's been a fair bit of debate in the markets and the press around the fiscal spend and whether the government will need to do more. Um, does Montgomery have a view as a house on the fiscal and the monetary uh, responses in Australia? Well, we're not, we're not macro managers, uh, so we don't have a house view on that. Um, we all have, I guess, individual views. Uh, I think the, the consensus is that basically um, the response has been rapid, uh, it's been uh, more than sufficient, uh, and it surprised the market by, its, I guess, its magnitude. Uh, and so unlike the GFC where, you know, there was a lot of, uh, I guess a, a lot of navel gazing before anything was done, and consequently, you know, the depth of that crisis uh, didn't occur for some months after it began. The central banks have really cut this off at the pass very quickly, 
Uh, and so the RBA, the US Federal Reserve, I mean, they announced just a few days ago that they're now going to buy junk bonds. Um, you know, they're going to support not just not just uh, investment grade bonds, but but even lower than investment grade bonds or sub investment grade bonds. Uh, and so, you know, that really is a massive response. That's that's bringing out the big artillery uh, to send a signal to the market that. Uh, it will do everything, the central bank will do everything that it can uh, to ensure that liquidity exists, uh, to ensure that what everything that they can do is being done. That gives the market some confidence. Now, whether it's enough to save the economy from a protracted recession, uh, I don't know. Uh, what we do know is that, and this is something we've discussed in our investment committee meetings, but you know, sacking a 1,000 people is a lot easier to do than hiring a thousand people, so just the process of re-employing people, presuming all the businesses that have shut down survive, and they will, they won't. Um, uh, you know th that that's a big ask. Uh, you know, will all those people get a job? Uh, yes, eventually. How long will that take? It'll be longer than we expect. So then that comes that circles back to what the government's doing. Is it enough uh, to get people back in a job in a month's time or two months' time? Well. Probably not, but you know what? At some point, the government has to say we've done all that we can, and it's now up to capitalism uh, to to work its magic mm -hmm. for the free market to take over. But indeed, I certainly, I certainly think the uh, the both the monetary and fiscal response has sort of flown under the radar radar um, in recent weeks due to the you know the real human impact that. COVID nineteen is having on our society and our and our country and the world at the moment there, but yeah. it does seem extraordinary the actions that were announced, and we certainly saw an improvement in conditions in the bond market globally uh, post the actions of the central banks when they all um, they all came together, and um, it certainly improved liquidity and trading in the fixed interest markets that um, oh, that yeah. I have uh, that I've seen. And what the RBA has done there is terrific. Not only have they cut rates to 0.25, but they've bought three-year bonds, you know, which is which has supported a, a low interest rate in three-year bonds, which in turn uh, provides liquidity and low rates for for uh, household loan, fixed household loans and fixed business loans. And so, you know, there's there's a there's a lot that the RBA has done that I don't think people appreciate. Uh, but you know, they, I think they've done everything that they need to do. Um, to ensure that markets operate effectively uh, and markets don't panic. Uh, and and I, that's, what, that's what we've seen. Before we bring you the second part of this chat, a little bit about who we are. NetWealth is an ASX-listed company established to help Australians take control of their financial futures. With a wide range of super and investment accounts, a huge variety of investment options and market-leading online tools, we can help you manage your wealth your way. Partner with us to see wealth differently and discover a brighter future. Visit the NetWealth website to learn more and get the PDS, which you should read before making a decision. Products issued by NetWealth Investments Limited. Now, with Australia's unemployment rate heading to 10%, um, but given this has really been caused by just a complete industry shutting down, such as the hospitality sector. Um, and I guess also given your past comments about starting to focus on post-COVID-19 and how the economies will start to reopen, do you believe um, that unemployment can really reduce quickly when the lockdown rules are relaxed? Uh, no, I don't, because I just, as I said a moment ago, I think... Hiring takes a lot longer than firing, um, and consequently, it will be some time. Uh, it will be some time before we see uh, unemployment back to where it was. Um, so, yeah, it's just going to take longer. Just the the practical, logistical, um, mechanical process of hiring people. Uh, it, it takes longer, uh, and and that's just a fact. So anyone who thinks that it's all going to come back quite quickly uh, are kidding themselves. 
Okay, so moving on to the Australian market, you've been concerned for some time now that valuations were overstretched and as a result have held defensive positions in your portfolios and you, you sort of touched on this earlier in the podcast. Where do you think valuations are at the moment? Is it, is it you know, do you really have a handle on whether they're cheap, reasonable or expensive across the Australian equity market? So... Yeah, it's a good question. It, it's it's a difficult question to answer because normally what we do when we're calculating intrinsic values, which we knew were were completely out of step with reality before Christmas, and you might remember when we last met, I was explaining why we had so much cash uh, in the Montgomery Fund and the Montgomery Private Fund. You know, we were sitting between twenty and thirty percent cash. Um, the reason was it was obvious that. Earnings estimates were declining at the same time that prices were going up. And so prices were were just out of step with reality, as I, as I mentioned. Uh, but now it's not so easy to work out whether they're cheap or expensive because the earnings has vaporised. So we don't know what the earnings are going to be. And we talked a moment ago about Flight Centre closing 800 stores. You know, any attempt to kind of estimate earnings in this environment really is a bit of a waste of time. Uh, and I know that analysts are trying desperately to work out what a company's earnings are going to be, but we've seen almost 150 companies pull their earnings guidance. Those companies don't know what their earnings are going to be. They're currently locked down. They're not in business. Um, there's no way Flight Centre can tell you. Graham Turner can't tell us what earnings are going to be in 12 months or 24 months' time. Can't tell us what, what they're going to be in six months' time. So... You know, we just assume that revenue is zero and uh, earnings are torched for the next 12 months. And then what we do is we start putting conservative estimates around what the long-term earnings of a company might be, remembering that it's a company is worth the present value of all its future cash flows, not just the next 12 months or 18 months. And so that's even that is going to be really, really rough. When we do all of that, we get to a point where we think the market is maybe fair value to a little bit expensive uh, because we think that the market is being overly optimistic about how quickly we come out of this. Um, it's right to be optimistic that there'll be an end to the lockdowns. It's wrong to be optimistic that the you know that we go from uh, we're really push starting the economy again and that we go from a stalled economy to something uh, that's reasonable or acceptable in a short space of time. I think that's optimistic. Where we'll get to is that in you know 12 months time or in 18 months time, we've still got a sputtering economy. We've got massive deleveraging to occur. There's lots of lots of government debt. Uh, and so you know that's going to take some time to work its way through. Uh, and that means that we'll end up in a market pool that won't look anything like the market that we saw before. So that, you know, that 10 years of northeasterly markets with, you know, with no negative years, that's not going to happen again. We're going to return yeah, to a great a, decade. Yeah, we're going to return to normal markets, what I call normal markets, the, the markets I, I learned to invest in when I came out of university in the 1990s. You know, that's you get a positive year, you get a negative year. You get a positive year, you get a negative year. And and uh, we don't know what the order, what order they'll take, but it'll be more cyclical than unidirectional. Mm -hmm. So what sectors are really concerning you the most? Um, and is it the more defensives that you're holding at the moment in the portfolio or is it some of the more uh, growth stocks that have really been beaten up in value? Um, yeah, where, where are your analysts really focusing their time? So we, we um, again, not concerned about sectors but, you know, looking for opportunities. We What we did before the crisis emerged or before the outbreak emerged um, or became serious, it had already emerged because I – just as an aside, I came back from an overseas trip in late January and my family and I were all wearing face masks at the airport in Tokyo and also uh, at the airport in Sydney and on the plane. And um, so coronavirus was an issue then. So when we when we got back to Sydney, touched uh, touch land again and went into the office, uh, we gathered our research together. We were tracking 
testing rates around the world, we could see that it was going to get a lot worse. So we 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 increased our cash weighting quite considerably. And then what we also did, and this answers your question, what we also did is we moved the portfolio to a low lower beta portfolio. So we we moved into more what are regarded as high quality defensive. I shouldn't say high quality because all of our holdings are high quality, but bigger cap, high quality defensive companies with a lower beta. So we we held more cash and we reduced the volatility of the equity in part of the portfolio. Now what we're doing is we're thinking about what other sectors and companies that might be best most leveraged to a recovery. Uh, and some of those things are, for example, uh, some of the some of the roads. So transurban, um, uh, for example, Atlas Arteria, which owns a big stake in about two thousand eight hundred kilometres of French toll roads. Uh, you know that will France is France is shut down at the moment, completely shut down. There aren't many cars driving around. Uh, and uh, that's going to return. Um, and logistics will be an important part of the recovery story. Uh, and so we're going to see a lot more road transport. We're going to see a lot more people travelling domestically because probably international travel will slow for a while or stay shut down for longer. Uh, and so, you know, that's an example of where we're trying to make investments now without necessarily reducing our cash very much. We are reducing cash but also increasing the beta or the, the 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 riskiness of the portfolio. And riskiness, I don't mean we want to make risky investments. We just want to increase the exposure to the recovery. So you have actually reduced your cash uh, holding just, over the last just eight slightly. weeks? Uh, no, not over the last eight weeks, but probably over the last three. Um, yep. Yeah, so over the last three weeks, uh, we've reduced the cash slightly, uh, but we're also increasing the beta of our invested portfolio. So pulling out of things that have held up really well. So reducing, for example, Telstra, which has held up really well, relatively speaking, um, you know, it's gone down much less than other things. Uh, and now we're increasing our exposure to those things that have gone down a lot that we think are safe, high quality, uh, but leverage to the recovery. Okay, now moving on to the Australian dollar, it's fallen considerably against the US dollar over the last couple of months and certainly has acted as an, a cushion to our economy. Um, what companies are the winners and, and who are losers as a result of the um, the fall in the A dollar? Well, the A dollar, you might remember going into the crisis, the A dollar was about 65 cents or there, about 64 or 65 cents. It then fell during the crisis to about 55. It's now back to 64. Um, so it's almost as if the, for the dollar, the crisis never happened. Um, uh, it, it, it hasn't, on a net basis, it hasn't fallen all that much. Trying to pick the currency is really, really difficult. I moved a lot of our uh, term deposit money into US dollars and British pounds. This is personally. Um Ahead of ahead of the crisis, uh, and I that was at about sixty four cents. Uh, I exited those positions at about sixty one or sixty two cents, thinking it had, it had fallen as much as it was going to, and then it fell to fifty five. It's now bounced back to sixty four. The whole point of that story is it's really really hard to pick currency movements. You know, it's just you, you know the big moves, but the little moves are just noise, and it's difficult to predict. We want to have exposure to businesses that are growing overseas. Uh, that means our by I guess we're 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 hoping that the Aussie dollar falls rather than rises. Uh, but but we also own domestic businesses, so it doesn't matter that much to us. Rather than thinking about where the Aussie dollar is going to go, we're thinking about where companies are generating their revenue. And if they're generating their revenue in a way that isn't necessarily exposed to the vicissitudes of the economy, for example, a company like um, uh, you know a medical a medical company, Avita Avita Medical, for example, it sells the resell uh, um, uh, application for uh, for burns victims, uh, and so it sprays skin cells onto the burn site, uh, helping recovery rates speed up recovery rates, uh, reduce hospital times, and so on. Um, so that's a business where the product being sold 
isn't discretionary. And if it's not discretionary, then it's less likely exposed to the economy. Uh, and so they're the sorts of businesses we want to gain exposure to. And I know I'm not, I know it's nothing to do with the currency, but it's how we think about earners. So we're not thinking about does this earn Aussie dollars, does it earn US dollars? That doesn't matter as much to us simply because we don't really have a view on the currency. What matters to us is just where it's generating its revenue from and is that revenue channel uh, exposed to the economy in any way. Yeah, it's interesting there, I guess, that, um, yeah, at the end of the day, we can't pick the the $8. I'm, I'm with you that, you know, there are very few, if any, people that can actually uh, trade currency and trade currency profitably. Um, but I think a key comment and a theme that's coming through from our discussion this morning, Roger, is that difference between a consumer staple and a consumer discretionary, i.e. companies that are manufacturing something that is a discretionary spend versus a, a staple like, as you say, um, the the skin cell spray on for burns victims or toll roads or those types of companies there that I think if you do build a portfolio with an anchor to a consumer staples, you certainly should have lower level of volatility compared to the broader market there. Yeah, um, the caveat... Paul, Paul, if I can just add, you know, that's a really good comment that you make. People immediately turn, you know, when they think about consumer staples, they think about the supermarkets, for example. And just one caveat with the supermarkets, if anyone's thinking about that, is that we believe that they've really performed their role in a portfolio now. So Coles and Woolies, you know, they held up really well, uh, of course, because people were, were hoarding toilet paper, amongst other things. But, but you've got to remember now what that's done is it's front-loaded. It's brought forward a lot of earnings for the, um, for the uh, supermarkets. So people have, if, if people's houses are now stacked to the rafters with toilet paper, they're not going to need to buy that product from the supermarket uh, for some months and you won't be able to return it either. So, um, so it means that the, the, that revenue source has been front-loaded or brought forward. Uh, so just rem, rem, remind yourself of that uh, if you think that supermarkets are going to continue doing as well as they've done in the recent past. Yeah, they certainly appeared for mine that it's a, a temporary earnings spike um, that will certainly normalise, I think, in line with um, with society uh, getting back to whatever the new normal will be post-COVID-19. Indeed. Um, we normally finish with asking our guests for any tips on uh, investing, but I thought particularly at the moment, have you got any thoughts or comments for the listener in terms of navigating the current uh, financial crisis we're experiencing? Um, yeah, I think, I think the bottom line, what this, what this has demonstrated to me and to everyone that follows us uh, has been um, that value investing works. Uh, value investing is not dead. Uh, you know, we, when we spoke, Paul, last year, you know, we were we were very out of step holding that cash uh, and people thought, you know, we're crazy not participating in a bull, the biggest bull run in history or the one of the longest bull runs in history. Um, but, but you know, and, and people started to say value investing is dead. Value investing doesn't work anymore. And, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plant my flag in the sand and say it, it does work. It works really well. It will always work. It goes for it goes through periods of underperformance, uh, but eventually markets prove that buying high quality businesses when they're cheap will work decade after decade after decade. So just keep mm. doing that. Mm. No, I um, I think over the last couple of years, I I have seen a number of articles even questioning whether value investing was dead and why anyone should have a value style in their portfolio. Um, mm. And I remember chuckling because as a younger guy starting in this industry in the early 1990s, I remember a similar debate around growth investing as well. And I think at the end of the day, both of them have a role to play in a client's portfolio, but I think particularly you should get, I guess, uh, a lower level of volatility out of a value style investment strategy as opposed to a growth style. Um, yeah, I think that. Yeah, I, I think that the value and growth are two sides of the same coin. You know, you mm -hmm. can't you can't value a company unless you know what its growth is going to be. 
Uh, and so I'm happy to buy a high growth company, but I just want to pay a reasonable price for it. Uh, and uh, and that's what everyone should be doing. I think that's your point. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and finally, given most of us are now working from home, what tips can you provide our listeners for surviving at home in isolation and really not annoying the family too much? Well, I think the issue is it's a good question. Um, we are created to be relational. Uh, so humans are relational beings. You know, we like gathering. Um, that's why, you know, that's why pubs make so much money. People like to get together. Uh, and 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 that won't change. And so it's important to recognise that that is important, that that's essential to our DNA. Uh, and so working from home isn't really an issue provided you can still talk to people. And I think what we're doing today, Paul, talking on a, you know, in a podcast, uh, we use, my, my family use Zoom. Uh, I don't think it's secure enough, so I don't use it for work. Um, but, you know, we use Teams, Microsoft Teams and Skype and connecting with people uh, is really, really important. We've got a team of gardeners in our garden at the moment um, planting some plants. So I go out there, keep my distance and just have a chat uh, to those guys and see how they're getting on. It's just important to change the people you're talking with. It's important to talk to new people or different people all the time. And it's important to get outside, go for a walk, and you won't bump into people literally, but as you walk past, you know, say good day and, 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 uh, yeah, have something to say up your sleeve because that breaks the monotony of working from home. Yeah, I must admit, getting the dogs out for a walk of a day, I have, um, I've been amazed at how much more social everyone is out on the uh, out on the daily yeah. walk. So, Paul, I reckon if we could understand dogs and we could understand what they were saying, if we could convert them to convert their language to English, they'd be saying, "Please don't take me for another walk today." <laughs> <laughs> oh, correct. I think uh, dogs actually are one of the um, the receiving one of the positive outcomes of uh, yes. coronavirus and they're working from home. So it's a lot fitter, fitter dogs. Exactly, exactly. Roger, thank you very much for joining us today and providing Always a insights. Pleasure, Paul. Great to be with you. Um, Thanking you and uh, thanking Montgomery for uh, for the support and the, the products you've got available on the platform. To the listener, I hope you guys are all safe and well. Um, and thank you for joining us for today's Portfolio Construction Podcast and I look forward to joining you soon. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the NetWealth Portfolio Construction Podcast Series. For more episodes and to subscribe to our series, visit our website, www.netwealth.com.au or visit the iTunes Store or Spotify. We hope you can tune into our next episode.